Okay, it's 11.30, let's get started. Are we okay? Right, so, hi, Simon Reason, and this is... Mike Pollard. And we're going to do an enterprise experiment. So I would like to ask you a question, a very simple question first. Who here has successfully introduced Agile into one single team? Come on, let's get those hands up. Absolutely marvellous, right about half the room, I'd say. So... I want you to be truthful here. Did you get it right first time? Huh? No, probably not. I bet you tried different things. You tried things that would maybe successful, maybe not. What you're actually doing was experimenting. So when we introduce Agile into the enterprise, to make that successful, we need to be able to run experiments as well. That's right, Simon. So what we're going to do today is show you some uh, observations and questions that we're constantly seeing and asking ourselves when we scale in the enterprise. And we're going to do that by doing some scientific and yeah, maybe not so scientific experiments live on stage. So, great. So like any good scientist, we've got a hypothesis. We have got a hypothesis, and here's ours. So our hypothesis reads, as we scale, then the simple theories applied to a single team will remain the same across the enterprise. So what do we mean by that, Simon? Well, let's think about all those that had their hands up, how you introduced Agile into that first team. I bet you got them collaborating with your customers. I bet you understood the capacity of the team so that you could start to understand the flow of work as it came through the team. I bet that you were thinking about how do we get those highest value items out of the door first? And as we introduce Agile into our single team, it's all quite simple. We create an environment where the team can become self-empowered, self-organizing, self-managed. Very, very simple. So, when we scale in the enterprise, why isn't it just as simple as we do it with one single team? Mike, why don't we try one of these scientific experiments? Let's do an experiment, and always safety first. Oh, Simon. I think yeah, we should, I forgot uh, about that. Some there coats on. All right. I don't really want to uh, have an accident. Mess up my lovely shirt. That's right. Ugh. Okay. Just amuse yourselves for a moment while we uh, organise. So, should we introduce some props? About yeah, let's energy? try that. Let's try it. Let's see where we go with this. So, I'd like you to imagine for a moment, I can do myself up. So, I'd like you to imagine for a moment that this here cone represents a delivery team, our single agile team. We'll call this the cone team. Like any good team, they have a backlog. So, this jug represents our backlog of stuff, and inside that backlog, represented by rice, are the features that we hope to pull into the delivery team and release. So this contains the value features. This rather lovely container here is um, what is going to capture those built features. So we'll call this the capturing built features container. That's a brilliant name, right? Thank you very much. Love it. Just thought of that. So uh, Simon, I was wondering if I could have five seconds on our clock, please. Yes, you've got five seconds. Do you need five a hand? On the clock. So the cone team are going to pull some value features and deliver those into our capturing the pot. So on my mark, Simon, if you'd like to can start we, us off. Can we just make sure that Mike hears, right, at this countdown? All right, I want to hear you. Okay, so ready? Uh, and go. Five, four, three, two, one. And stop, four. Mike, please. We had a bit of an opening problem there. Oh, it's stop. okay. Thank you. It's okay. So what we can see here, just by going our single agile team, is that our team have delivered some features or built some delivery features. What we've also shown you is, I bet if we did this again, there's no way that that team would be able to deliver that entire backlog in five seconds. So straight away, we're starting to get an understanding of that team's capacity. Now, a bit of a blockage in our uh, team at the moment. We'll sort that out. <laughs> now, if I was to change the word team and say this represents the enterprise, then our theory still remains the same. If we start to get an understanding of the... Um, capacity of a single team and the flow of that, and why can't we get an understanding of the capacity and flow of the enterprise? So what we're saying is, is that 
yeah, if we understand the capacity of a single team, that simple theory remains the same as we scale in the enterprise. If we understand at a single team how we build and deliver those highest value items first, that simple theory remains the same across the enterprise. If we have that simple theory where we create an environment where a single team can self-manage, self-organize, it's simple. We do that at the enterprise. The thing is, though, time and time again, when we start introducing these ideas, we start encountering difficulties and we start encountering issues. So me and Simon have been spending our, I don't know how many years, working together, running a number of experiments in, these enterprise, in, the, in the enterprise to try and understand why. So, like any good scientist, we look to our colleagues for inspiration. And our very happy chap here, Mr. Thomas Henry Uxley. He's very happy. Look at him. Once said that the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. Well, we've been working and trying to prove this hypothesis for a number of years, and we've yet to find an ugly fact that disproves this idea. And there's another chap that we took some inspiration from. Another happy one. He looks happy as well, doesn't he? So the point is this, right? We haven't got the answers. You probably haven't got the answers. But what we do know is that there's lots and lots of questions we need to be asking ourselves to make this a success. Um, Mike, why don't we have a look at the, um, what we're trying to prove behind this hypothesis? Let's have a look at that. So, ha <laughs> ha, you see, I came prepared. So, as you can see, no expense spared on our idea. But this drawing, and I'll, I'll, I'll reveal it all in a moment, is something that we've presented a few, a few occasions. And this is our theory behind um, scaling agile. So if those that kept their hands up must have an idea about single teams. So we've got an idea. We've called it Project A for a moment, but this could be anything, a big idea. And we work collaboratively with our customers and stakeholders, represented by the red people there. And we unpack that, and we create a backlog. And we're constantly working iteratively and delivering something into production. Pretty simple. Well, if we scale, it's just more ideas and more teams. And as long as we collaborate with our customers and work closely together, as long as we have a good understanding and constantly refining that backlog of work, it's just a bigger backlog of work. It's pretty simple, right? Seems simple. So let's take a step back. Again, let's just think about that, that first team. I bet you picked a project which wasn't too risky. I bet the team that you had working on that first Agile project, you knew they were going to succeed. You knew that that team knew each other quite well so they could start to collaborate. I bet that you gave them the whole environment where they could start to self-manage themselves. You helped them. So we actually have everything we need for that one team to be successful. Then what happens? I want some of that, right? I want to do what they're doing because they're bloody successful, right? So what do we do? We say, let's build more agile teams. Let's spin them up en masse. Is that a great idea? I don't know. Maybe we should run some experiments on that and find out what that feels like. Let's do that, Simon. Why don't we do that? So let's introduce our first idea, which is what we affectionately call let the right one in. So our decision and our idea to change the way that we work, and we work in an agile way, we're starting to use words like co-location, collaboration, knowledge share, working closely together as a team, all these wonderful things. We put a lot of energy, and as Simon just talked about, we put a lot of energy in setting up that first team and showing that that can work in the organization that we work in. So the question is, is I, why don't we put that energy as we spin these teams up en masse? We've put it into a single team, but when we spin them up, are we, are we really thinking about the team now? Are we really thinking about all the members in all the teams? Or are they just a, another resource that we can push into another team? So Here's an experiment. experiment. Yes, I like right, this one. So let me introduce you to what we call the balloon team. This is a balloon team, and it's a high-performing team in the organization that we work in. There's a vacant, oh, the circle, just before we go on, the circle represents that balloon team's culture. They've nurtured that, they've worked together, and they've worked together for a while, and that now represents the team's culture that they're very proud of. 
there's a vacancy for that team. Uh -huh. And uh, here's the vacancy. We need somebody to join that team. And this is the, the balloon team's vacancy. Yeah. Which, here it is. Here it is. So we need somebody to be able to develop in dot balloon. That's an essential part of being part of the balloon team. They need to have five years experience because it's quite, a, uh, quite an intensive role. We need somebody who knows what they're doing, hit the ground running. They need to have some understanding of Agile, working in an Agile way. They need to be able to work in a team because that's how we collaboratively work. And desirable but not essential is that they should be able to develop in pink dot balloon. So here's our vacancy. This is what we, uh, what we hope to do. Simon, have you got any candidates that could potentially join this Funny you should team? ask that question, because we have done some interviews, and we've got a couple of candidates on our, on our short list. We have. Yes. Okay, so. Let me introduce two you. Two candidates, all very happy, all very nicely. Uh, Pink nicely dot changed. candidate and uh, red dot candidate. All right, so let's go through, let's go through our vacancies. So uh, dot balloon developers, can they develop in dot balloon? Well, of course they can. Look at them. Okay, good point. Um, five years experience? Uh, yeah, pink candidates got seven, and the red candidates got six. Brilliant. Um, Agile, any experience in working in an Agile way? Well, obviously, and they've told me they're at Agile India right now. Agile India, but you asked them at the interview. You asked them, you asked them uh, um, at the interview, and they, they, uh, well, they, said, they said yes. yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, work in a team. Did they have the ability to work within a team? Um, they said yes to that as well. Fantastic. Uh, what about pink dot balloon? Uh, well, look, you're asking another question, that pink dot balloon. So we have someone that ticks all the boxes, and we've asked Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Not so much this one. Well, fantastic. Well, that's, uh, that sounds like, I don't know about you, but Mr. Pink seems like the perfect candidate to me. Total. Okay, I'll bring so him let's, over. Uh, let's bring him over to the team and put him into the team, please. All right. Let's see what happens. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> um, so what we've just done is we've just pushed Mr. Pink into that delivery team, and we've now broken that team's culture. So let's try that again. Same candidates, same interview process. But now let's bring the team to the candidates. So you're going to have to come over here, Simon, because it's probably better viewed. <laughs> so now let's try Mr. Pink into that team. And I think you'll notice that as a team member, I'm now deciding whether or not Mr. Pink will fit. Uh -huh. He doesn't. So now let's try Mr. Mr. Red. Mr. Red actually fits into that team, and I'm now pulling that candidate into my team without breaking the team's culture. Marvelous. Marvelous. <laughs> so what we're trying to demonstrate here is working in this new way isn't just about having a list of skills that you tick, and it's now a resource. That, I hate the word resource, but it's now what people call a resource that they can just push into a team, and that will tick all of the boxes. One of the best places that I ever worked in, back in the UK, was an organization that, put, that was very proud about the culture that it created and very proud about um, uh, how it worked. And it recognized the fact that each team has its own culture too. So if anybody joined the organization or anybody that was going to join the team, they went through a process, a rigorous process, to ensure that they were the right fit. Because we knew that by breaking that culture would potentially disrupt the team from within. So we had a massive HR process, on-site recruiters were involved, and the biggest thing that we did was we ensured that the teams were the ones that made the final choice. So each candidate would come in, they'd sit and work with the delivery team, they would go to meetings, they potentially might pair with one of the developers. All part of that process to ensure we don't break that team's culture and that we make the right choices. So the questions we ask ourselves when we start to scale Who's are... Sorry, Mike, go on. That's right. Who's really making the, the decision on bringing the right one in? And are we thinking about letting that right person in so that each team is set up for success? Just like we do with a single team, where we create the environment for those, set up that success, we need to do that as we scale in the enterprise. So, you know, in a single team, they're always talking together, they're sharing knowledge, they're sharing ideas. In the enterprise, we've got to do exactly the same. So you just might need to make it a little bit more formal. So you might want to have brown bag sessions, rock-ups where people come and share their knowledge. Or book clubs, video clubs, where we talk about things and start to bounce ideas off each other. Um, 
Another great thing to get that collaboration going is activity-based working. That means that when I come into the office in the morning, I can sit wherever I like and whoever with I like to get the work done. So if we're creating and focusing on creating that environment for our teams, there's a few things, though, that we need to really think about. So are we actually getting the teams to build the right things? Are they really close to their customers? That's a very good question, Simon. So this is what we affectionately call golf course to cash, because as we all know, all the greatest ideas in an organization come off that executive golf course. You play a lot of golf, don't you, Mike? Uh, yeah, I'm particularly. I you did, yeah. I'm actually really quite rubbish at it, to be honest, but you know. Um, anyway, so we split golf course to cash up into three things, idea, build, and release. So if we think back to that single team, the idea, build, and release notion is pretty much blurred together. As a single team, as we all know, those that had their hands up at the start, um, we're working already pretty closely with their customer. If I'm a customer and stakeholder, if I have a really good idea, I know exactly where to take it, and I can put it in front of the delivery team that I'm collaborating with, and we can talk about what we can build and when we can build it by. That team will then work with the customer and build it, then we'll release that, short incrementally, short increments, release some value, get some feedback, and the whole process continues. Pretty simple. It is simple. But what happens when we scale? What happens to that idea to done? Because most of the energy we put in is in the build and release phase. I know that's what we do, right? So we put energy into those great XP practices like test-driven development, continuous delivery, continuous integration. We put energy into making sure that we can do great scrum practice or Kanban. So what happens is the build and release phase, they start to merge. We put, we've got a very slick way of actually releasing. But getting my idea from that golf course all the way to those teams is still a major issue. Because if I've got an idea, what have I got to do? When I'm working with multiple teams, I've probably got to create a large idea so that I can get my um, budget approvals. I've got to create business cases. I've got to do um, some form of funding. I've got to go to steercos. I've, I've got to do portfolio. I've got loads and loads of things to do just to get my idea into those teams. This is what we like to call that organizational idea maze. So the questions we like to ask ourselves when we scale in the enterprise is, are we close to our customers? And are we able to quickly put those ideas off the golf course into action? And have we really thought about how the flow of that work gets from the idea to done? And are we always so focused on that build and release? Have we even considered the idea, the organizational idea maze? Have we even thought about changing it? Or are we still working to contractual agreements between idea handing off to build? So generally, we see a clash between the way that we always seem to work in idea and the way that we want to work when we introduce Agile in build and release. So one of the things that we've really learned is we need to really take a holistic view. if We want to really make this work in the enterprise and think about idea, build, release. So think about golf course to cash. We need to be spending a lot more time in understanding and working within that organizational idea maze. So we've looked at the questions that come up when we're trying to be close to our customers. Let's have a look at some of the other things where we get hindrance from that organizational idea maze. So this is what we rather affectionately call from pot to pot. So one of the big advantages, as we all know, in working in this way is short incremental builds, release into production, feedback, and continue. So the ability to release early and get that return on investment. Again, pretty simple. Um, why don't we uh, do another experiment? Do you know what? I think that's a really uh, cool idea. idea. Now, for this one, I need one volunteer from the audience. 
So I don't volunteer, like to come please up. don't be shy, or I might have to pick on my wife, and she won't be very happy. No, no volunteers? Here we go. Thank yeah, you, well sir. done, come sir. On. Come on up to the stage. Big round of applause for our man here. Come on, what's your name? Rahul, Rahul, here he is. Okay. Sorry, what's, the, what's the name, sorry? Rahul. Rahul. Rahul, thank you, nice to meet you. Hi. So, for this experiment, let's just imagine for a moment that we've taken our idea through that organisational idea maze, and we've now come up the other end. Typically, what we'll see is we'll have some funding, some funding approved for us to spend on our idea. So, have we got any funding? Have we got any funding, Rahul? No, he says, but I'll tell you, I've got some. Look, come on with me. All right. Okay, so if, you, if we can just bring our funding, let's see if you just tell me, we'll push it over here. Fantastic. There we go. All right, we've got a funding pot, Mike. We've got some funding, that's fantastic. And typically, what, all, what we also see is that at the end of that organizational maze, there is some form of scope, some kind of stuff that we're kind of saying that we're going to build and deliver for that funding. So, this team here, the cone team, this is, for the purpose of this experiment, this is the scope that we said that we're going to deliver for that funding, which is in the funding pot. In the funding pot? Cool. Have we it delivered is. something already? We have delivered something already. We've, uh, we've delivered something. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build this iteratively. So we're going to use the cone team to build this thing iteratively. Um, and the cost of each iteration is 80,000 Australian dollars. It's quite an expensive team. It's 80,000 Australian mm. dollars. Okay. Should we have a look in the funding pot, Rob? Yeah. Cool. All right. How much have we got here? $80,000. $80,000. So, so if we hold, hold that, Simon, and let us... Oh, yeah, we need to put some goggles on. Oh, you've got glasses. You'll be okay. Don't worry. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. Here we are. $80,000. Gone. Gone. Right. <laughs> so we've just spent $80,000 on uh, building something. So we're now going to move into iteration number two. That's uh, another $80,000 that another we're going to spend. Another $80,000. So we're yeah. going to be building some stuff. $80,000. Right, so we've just spent $80,000 there. Right, so at the end of iteration number two, we have some value. We've done two iterations, and we now have some value that we could potentially release to our customers and get some value in return. So what would you like to do, Raoul? What would you, what like, would you to like to do? do? Would you like to release into production? No. You wouldn't like to release into production? What do you think Rahul should do? <laughs> what, release yeah. back into production our value? Get the value back. Okay. Well, yeah, hey, well right. done. Good I'll talk, about, I'll talk about you in a minute. <laughs> so the thing is, though, our cone team, we haven't, got, we haven't got a lot of continuous integration. We haven't got a lot of one keep releases. So our cone team, we're going to have to spend some time and energy. Am I on? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to spend some time and energy putting this into production. It's going to cost them an iteration to do that. That's another 80,000 then, is it? That is another 80,000 yeah, that we've just on, spent, then. but we're going to put that oh. into production. I think that's a fantastic thing. Right, so now we're going to move on to iteration number four. So iteration number four, which is, believe it or not, another $80,000. So oh. we're now going to bring some stuff to another 80,000. Just spent some more money. <laughs> Bit of a blockage in my team at the moment. Didn't happen in rehearsal. Brilliant. Well, what's that you got on your hands, Simon? Uh, well, this is a bit of value that we've got back. So we've got some value from that early release that we've done. Fantastic. Cool. So I'm going to put this in the enterprise value pot. Enterprise value pot. We've got some value returned from that early release. See, it's good release. Iteration right? number five. We're now going to move on to iteration number five. And All right. Guess what? There you go. Another 80,000 bucks. Iteration number five has been done. Brilliant. More value. More value coming back. That's excellent. Lovely. I'll put that in the... Enterprise value pot. So we're now starting to prove that our product is returning some value. Right, so moving on to iteration number six. Iteration number six. No money. We've got no money. So we've run out of money. Empty pot. So the enterprise investment pot, or the project investment pot, is now empty. But hang on a minute, we've still got some value here that we need to be building. Okay, cool. Have we got any money over there? Can so we use that? We do have some money being returned. Cool. Uh, but unfortunately, that's in a different pot. That's actually in the um, enterprise return pot. It's certainly not in the idea investment pot. So unfortunately, we can't build this anymore. I can't continue to build this. All right. So how do we get our hands on that money, Mike? Well, unfortunately, to be able to redo this kind of stuff, I've now got to go back through the organizational idea maze and get my approval 
to finish building the high value items in this product. Do you fancy that? No, I don't yeah. think so, right? So you're telling me, right, so we've uh, released a load of value, we we've got some money back on our investment, we have. and to actually do anything else, we're going to have to go through that organizational idea maze. Pretty much, Rahul yes. says that's a bad idea. Yes. He's saying, why didn't you tell us that in the first place? It's true. Sorry about that. And maybe his answer was right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Rahul. Thank, Thank you. Round, round of applause for our balloon popper. Thank you very much. So believe it or not, this is actually based on a true event that I experienced. Um, and I was working with a fairly mature team, and we were working closely with our, with our customer. We had some work that we wanted to build and wanted to do. And after two iterations, the team were the ones who basically said, hang on a minute, we've got some really good value here. We've got some stuff that we could put into production, and it will make a big difference to our customer experience, big difference to our frontline colleagues. So why don't we put this into production? The stakeholder actually said no. I'd rather do it all at the end, thank you very much. Why what should I pay? Oh, yeah, sorry. Why was that? It's a good question. His response was, why should I pay for two releases? I only want to pay for one. Because the cost of doing those two releases means that there's some features that I might not get built. So I'd rather just do one release at the end and not worry about the value. So our, my response to that is, are we more concerned with maximizing the amount of features for the money that we spend? Or are we concerned with maximizing the amount of value for the money that we spend? And that's the question we ask ourselves, right? When we're scaling in the enterprise, why aren't we maximizing value? rather than just maximizing the number of features. Why aren't we focused on that? I mean, is it because we've got to negotiate that maze, right? So once I've negotiated that maze, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, right, I've got my money, and I'm going to spend that and deliver everything I can. Imagine if I've got multiple projects doing that. Man, they've got all their money, and they're going to spend it on my features, on my features, on my features. So are we sure that all those teams are working on the highest value items across the enterprise? Another good question, Simon. Oh, I always got good questions, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just explain this in a little bit more detail. So remember this from the start. So this is our single team and an idea coming through, working closely with our customers, team pulling highest value items off the top. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. And again, no expense spared in our PowerPoint skills. Um, so typically what we see when we scale is these ideas will come through that organizational maze. And what we'll do is we'll plug a, we'll form a project team, uh, we'll form a team around a project. Generally what we normally typically do, we'll resource up a project. So we generally have one team, one project, and that's how we work. And like any good team, they'll have a backlog, and they'll be working closely with their customers, and they'll be ordering each of their individual backlogs. The question Simon asked was, how can we be sure that we're delivering the highest value items for our customers right now across the enterprise? So why don't we take a step back and have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So if we actually ordered it based on value and based on what the organization needed to deliver for its customers right now, get a very different picture. So what we're saying is if, is if we decouple those teams from projects, they then have the ability to form their own culture. If we work closely with our customers and unpack that work and look across the enterprise at value, and we can start getting those teams to pull the highest value items off the top of the list and build what's needed for the customer right now. And by doing that, we'll take a step towards understanding the capacity and flow the enterprise, just like our cone team at the start. To do this, though, we need to be thinking small. And if we're thinking small across the enterprise, then we can get items out the door just like we do with a single team. And just before I ask the next question, Mike, that we ask ourselves, I'm going to take my goggles off. All right. Because I think we've finished those experiments. Well, yeah. All right. Good point. So, these are the questions that we really are asking ourselves now, is that, you know, if we, are we really thinking small enough so that we can order items across the whole of the enterprise and we're not just ordering projects? If we're always thinking small, think about what that means to golf course to cash. If we're thinking small, I haven't got to go and get 
massive amount of money for my project. I'm only asking for a very small amount. Maybe that organizational idea maze becomes a bit easier. If we're thinking small, think about what that may mean for your pot to pot. Because now I'm always going to deliver my features, right? Because I've just got a small number. So I'm not really worried about delivering all the features of my project. I'm actually going to maximize the value across the enterprise. And if we're thinking small, all those teams stay together. We don't have to create teams around a big project. So those teams actually start to get their culture, their own identity, and they can let the right one in. Now, having said all that, we're still trying to prove this hypothesis, right? We are. And let's remind you of our hypothesis. And it's uh, as we scale, then the simple theories applied to a single team will remain the same across the enterprise. We still, Simon and I, believe, as we mentioned at the start, this hypothesis rings true. But as we found through experimenting within these ideas, that more questions and more issues are continually uncovered as we go on this journey in the enterprise. In fact, you know what? That's the one thing that we have proved beyond all doubt, right? So just in a single team, just as those problems and issues surface, they still surface as we try and do this across the enterprise. So let's leave you with a few questions that you can ask yourselves. Let's ask yourselves, what experiments are you going to run to provide the right culture for teams in your organization? Let the right one in. What experiments are you going to run to ensure that you're working closely with your customers across the enterprise? Are you thinking golf course to cash? And what experiments are you going to run to make sure that you maximize value rather than maximize features? Are you thinking pot to pot? And what experiments are you going to run to ensure that you're building the highest value items for your customers across the enterprise? And here's a little bit of final advice. If you want to be successful, before running any of your own experiments, know why you're running them and what hypothesis you're trying to prove. Thank you for experimenting. There's Mike Pollard. Same um, reason. Thank you very much. Thank you. While we're here, right, so if you want to come up, you can come up and do whatever. <laughs>